Greetings, brethren. Welcome to the Sabbath before the Passover, 2020. And this is the first time in 10 years that we've had a Passover in the middle of the week. And on rare occasions, there's that 10-year gap where there are no Passovers in the middle of the week. However, in the, including this year, in the next five years, there will be three Passovers with the Passover in the middle of the week. So what we want to do, we want to look at some of the events leading up to the Passover and know, and we will see, that the Passover Sabbath, or the Sabbath before Passover, is the tenth day of Nisan, and is the day that the Passover lamb was to be selected. And we will see that Jesus was selected on that Sabbath before the Passover. So let's begin. We'll do a study covering the last six days, not all last six days, but parts of them leading up to Jesus' last Passover. Now, you can follow through in harmony if you have it, but let's begin in John, the 12th chapter, beginning in verse 1. John 12 and verse 1. Now, before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus, who had died, and whom he had raised from the dead. And they made a supper for him, and Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those who sat with him. Now, this anointing of Jesus was the first of two. We'll see a little later in Matthew 26 that two days before the Passover, he was anointed in the house of Simon the leper. So the account goes on showing that Mary took a pound of pure spikenard ointment worth a great price and anointed Jesus' feet, wiping his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the aroma of the anointment. And then Judas Iscariot, he's the one who brought up the problem, said, well, why is this money being wasted for this? Now, he was the one who carried the bag. In other words, all the incidental needs that were necessary for Christ and the apostles, he carried the bag for payment for it. So he was snitching out of the bag himself, and he wanted to sell it to put the money back in the bag. But Jesus said, verse 12, Let her alone, she is keeping it, Yes, she is keeping it toward the day of my burial. Quite an interesting thing, right? Okay, you always have the poor with you, the poor with you. Now, outside we're gathering because just a few days before, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And the people wanted to see him and wanted to see Jesus. And even the Scribes and Pharisees and priests were wanting to kill not only Jesus, but Lazarus. Verse 9, Then a great crowd of Jews found out that he was there, and they came not only because of Jesus, but also that they might see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priests took counsel in order that they might kill Lazarus also. Now we're going to see that many of the things that are done leading up to the time two days before the Passover, that Jesus brought great confrontation to the religious leaders and the scribes and the elders, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and challenged them because what they did, they made a religion overlapping and coming around all the laws and commandments of Moses. 
and that was basically what is known today as Judaism. Okay. Now here's why they wanted to kill him. Because by reason of him, many of the Jews were leaving them and believing in Jesus. Now all of this took place on the 8th of Nisan, and of course the day begins at sunset, and that was the first month, the 8th day. Okay, Wednesday night, then Thursday, the day portion, okay, then we have quite a few things happen here. So let's see what happened. Verse 12, on the next day, a great crowd of people who had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and were shouting, Hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Now, quite a thing. This was not Palm Sunday. Nor was it a Palm Sabbath. This was a Thursday. Now, think of this for a minute. If this were happening on the Sabbath, don't you think that the religious authorities would attack the disciples and the people for breaking off branches on the Sabbath and strewing them in the road. Of course they would have. Now verse 14, let's see what happens here. This is quite a thing. Now after finding a young donkey, Jesus sat upon it exactly as it is written. Now what happens here? Many scriptures are fulfilled. Now, how are they being fulfilled exactly the way that they should be? By the events that were taking place. And I am sure that many of the angels were orchestrating the timing of these events. And in, God was sending them also to inspire the people to come to Jerusalem. So here's the quote, verse 15. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king comes sitting on the colt of a donkey. And his disciples did not understand this at the beginning, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Then the group was that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, testified of what they had seen. So this was a marvelous thing. Because of this, the people also met him, for they heard of this miracle that he had done. Now notice why the Pharisees were wanting to get rid of Jesus and Lazarus. Verse 19, Then the Pharisees said among themselves, do you see we are not gaining in any way? Look, the world has gone after him. Well, that's quite a thing. They were afraid of losing power. Now, isn't that truth? The establishment. Once it's established and corrupted, does not want the truth, whether it's in religion or whether it's in government. See, people say they want the truth, but they really don't want the truth of God because that would convict them of their sins. Okay? Now, let's come to Let's come to Matthew 21. And here we see a beginning of a number of confrontations that Jesus had with the religious authorities, the scribes, the Pharisees, and also the Herodians. Okay. Matthew 21. Now, this shows where the they got the, the donkey and the colt and brought him 
brought them to Jesus. Okay? Now, verse 12. Matthew 21 and verse 12. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out those that were buying and selling in the temple, and he threw over that overthrew the tables of the money exchangers and the seats of those who were selling them. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Well, that's quite a thing, isn't it? That's exactly how it is in religion today. That's exactly how it is in the government today. And how these things are and the way that they take place. Let's come to Luke 19. Luke 19. So this last week of Jesus was really very powerful. And you know that the angels of God were involved. Satan and the demons were involved. Jesus and the apostles were involved. Now here in Luke 19, let's pick it up in verse 41. Okay. Verse 41. When he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying... If you had known, even you, at least in your day, the things for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Isn't that interesting? See, the spiritual blindness does not equal physical blindness. Spiritual blindness is that they can't see the truth, they can't understand the truth. And so they're, as Jesus said, the blind are leading the blind, and they will both fall into the ditch. So he continues, verse 43. For the day shall come upon you that your enemies shall cast a rampart about you and shall enclose you all around and keep you in on every side and shall level you to the ground. Now, he's talking about the city of Jerusalem. Absolutely true, that happened. And your children within you, and those shall not leave, and they shall not leave a stone upon a stone that shall not be cast, um, that shall be upon it, because you did not know the season of your visitation. And he went into the temple and began to cast out those who were selling and those who were buying. And then he said, it's written, a house of prayer. Now let's see what he did in the account of Mark. Because this becomes quite an important thing here indeed. Mark, the 11th chapter. Now a little sidebar on this. When first studying out the last 10 days, of Jesus' life. That led to understanding that only in Mark did the cursing of the fig tree cover a two-day period. I had two chronologies that in my very first Passover season in 1965 in Boise, Idaho, I wanted to do the last 10 days of Jesus' life. And I had notes from Dr. Herman Hay and from Dale Hampton. And I was using those as a guide for what I was to bring. And I found out that they were off. And I couldn't figure out where it was. So I took a piece of paper and marked Matthew at the top, a piece of paper, Mark, and a piece of paper, John, uh, Luke, and a piece of paper, John. And then I started the last six days before the Passover and went through everything and wrote down all of the scriptures, which then years later became incorporated into the Harmony of the Gospels, the last ten days of Jesus' life. 
But here in Mark, the 11th chapter, we find that the cursing of the fig tree occurred over a two-day period. When you look at the account in Matthew and in Luke, it looks like it's the same day, but it's not. So let's pick it up here. Let's pick it up here in verse 11. Mark 11 and verse 11. And Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple because the hour was already late. And after looking around at everything there, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And in the morning, as they left Bethany, he was hungry. Then seeing a fig tree afar off, that had leaves, Jesus went to see if it might possibly find something on it. But after coming to it, he found nothing except the leaves because it was not yet the season for grapes. And Jesus responded to it by saying, Let no one eat fruit from you any more forever. And the disciples heard it. Okay? Now then, quite an interesting thing, isn't it? They didn't know the season of the time of Jesus Christ. And so this fig tree pictures the way of Judaism. It didn't bring forth any fruit. Why? because the traditions of Judaism overlaid everything of the scripture and blinded the people. Okay? Now, let's continue on in the account here. Then they went into Jerusalem, and after come, entering the temple, Jesus began to cast out those who were buying and selling in the temple, overthrew the table of the money exchangers and the seats of those who were selling doves. Moreover, he did not allow anyone to carry a vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Now the chief priest and the scribes heard this, and they sought how they might destroy him, for they, they feared him, because all the multitude marveled at his teachings. Now notice verse 19. And when evening came, he went out of the city. Okay. Cursed the fig tree, went into the temple, did the teaching, casting out all the animals, overthrowing the tables, castigating the chief priests and the scribes and Pharisees. And then, when it was evening, he went out back to Bethany. Now, actually, the Mount of Olives. Verse 20. And in the morning, so it was cursed one day, they went into the temple, they left and went out of the city, and in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. So it was in the morning, day two. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Lord, or look, Master, the fig tree that you cursed has dried up. And Jesus answered and said to them, have faith from God. Now this is an interesting statement because in the Greek it means have the faith of God, which means that faith comes from God. Which then we know in the New Testament is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And this also is what it talks about in Galatians' the second chapter, but through the righteousness of the faith of Jesus are we justified. So this is a gift of God. Now there's always a certain amount of faith that people can have because people believe things. But to have a spiritual conviction of faith, 
that must come from God and from his spirit, not from within us. Okay. Now notice what he says. Verse 23, For truly I say to you, whoever shall say to this mountain, be taken away and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that what he said will take place, he shall have whatsoever he shall say. Now there's one caveat in this that Jesus gave in the model prayer. The will of God. If it is the will of God. Now, it's not going to be that people will go around and start casting out mountains and casting out hills and all of that sort of thing. But something that is harder than that to do is to convert the human mind. And that takes the faith of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, verse 24. For this reason I say to you, all the things that you ask when you are praying, believe that you shall receive them, and they shall be given to you. Now, that's a wonderful thing to understand. And you look back at your life. According to the will of God, the things that you have asked for, God has answered, he has given, maybe not necessarily in the same measure that you might necessarily have particularly wanted, but nevertheless, God answers those prayers. And there will even come a time when there will be something happened that you thought of, kind of in a, a glancing thought, but didn't think too much about it, then sometime later you look back and see, hey, God answered that thought. That's quite a thing. Here, hold right here. Let's come to Ephesians, the third chapter, because this is important. The very last verse in Ephesians, last two verses, Okay. Last two verses in Ephesians, the third chapter. Now, this is the kind of faith that we are to have, which comes from God. Now, he's not going to give us miracles to do so that we can show off. There has to be a purpose for everything that we ask for according to the will of God. But notice this promise Ephesians 3 and verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly. Now, that's also referring to the time of the resurrection, and the time will be in the kingdom of God, with the fullness of God, okay? Exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that is working in us. Now, that's quite a wonderful thing to understand. So, when Jesus said, have faith from God, or the faith of God, that's what he meant. Now then, come back to Mark 11, because here's another important principle that he was teaching to his apostles just before he was getting ready to be crucified, verse 25. Mark 11, verse 25. But when you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive. Also says in another place, go and work it out with the one that you have a difficulty with. Forgive so that your Father who is in heaven may forgive you your offenses. And that's a very important thing to understand. Now, the world likes to remember and hate. God wants love and repentance and mercy and reconciliation and forgiveness. That's the whole story of the New Testament. That's the whole purpose as to why Christ came. Okay? Now, let's continue on here. Let's continue on here in um, 
verse 27. Okay. No, verse 26. Yes. He said, verse 26, For if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive you your offenses. Then they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and scribes and elders came to him and said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? See, you have to have authority to come into the temple of God. Now think of what he was doing. Casting out the animals, casting out the money changers, overturning the tables, teaching the people. So they want to know what authority. Didn't get it from the high priest. Didn't get it from the, the elders. Who did he get it from? Okay. Verse 29, Then Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one thing, and if you answer me, I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Good lesson. Sometimes it's best to answer with a question. Now, why did he do it this way? Because he knew their hearts, and he knew that they were after him. Okay. So he asked them, the baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. Now look what they did. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, if we say, from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, they feared the people because everyone held that John was indeed a prophet. And they answered Jesus by saying, We don't know. Now that was an outright lie. They knew it was from God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Quite amazing indeed some of the confrontations that are coming along, okay? Interesting. Yes. Now then, let's come to John. Now, the time frame that we have, this is the 10th day of the first month. Let's come to John 12. Okay? This will be very interesting indeed. John 12 is quite a chapter covering many things indeed. And this is why we have the four Gospels to put it all together so that we make sure we have everything and all the facts that we need. Okay? John 12, and let's pick it up here in verse 20. Okay? Verse 20. John 12. Now were there, there were certain Greeks among them who had come up to worship at the feast. And these came to Philip, who were from Bethsaida of Galilee, and they asked him, saying, Sir, we desire to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, the time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Okay? Now remember, this is on the tenth day of the first month. And that was the day, that's today, the Sabbath before the Passover. But the sequence was a little different and was actually a week later in the year that Jesus went through these things. But for us, the tenth day of the first month is this Sabbath, the Sabbath before the Passover, the fourteenth day of the first month. So Jesus continued, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, 
it bears much fruit. So he's giving some good parables and teachings here. And then he makes it absolutely clear. Now I want you to tie the next couple of verses here uh, together with John 14 and verse 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to, f to the Father except through me. Now that's quite a thing. Okay. Now then, what are we to do in our lives, our own human nature, and what is conversion all about? Well, this next verse tells you. Verse 25. The one who loves his life shall lose it. And the one who loses his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. If anyone will serve me, let him follow me. And then we have the one in Luke 14 about counting the cost. That we have to have complete, and we will see a little later on, complete dedication to God the Father and Jesus Christ. Not to men, not to an organization, but to God the Father and Jesus Christ. And that our conversion grows deeper and deeper with the Spirit of God as we grow in grace and knowledge. And that's a tremendous thing for us, brethren. Think about that. God the Father who rules the universe, the great sovereign of the universe, and his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, our high priest, head of the church. They love us. They have called us. They have all of this that we're reading about all worked out so that Jesus would become the perfect sacrifice for the sin of the world. And that covers all the sins of the world because the sin of the world is what Adam and Eve did. They didn't obey the voice of God. And then, human nature, with the judgment of God, became hostile against God. And only true repentance, and true baptism, and true conversion can change that. And that's by and through the love and power and will of God. Okay? Now notice verse 27, because here is where Jesus was chosen by the Father on the tenth day of the first month, the Sabbath before Passover. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this very purpose I have come to this hour. Then notice what he said. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Now these are the very words that are at the beginning of the prayer in John 17. Let's go read that so we see how it all comes together. And that is talking about the crucifixion. And this was the tenth day of the first month, and this is when Jesus was chosen as the Lamb of God. Now here in his final prayer before he was arrested in John 17, Jesus spoke these words, verse 1, and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come, everything down to the hour. Glorify your own son so that your son may also glorify you. And he's talking about the crucifixion. That's what it's talking about back here in John, the 12th chapter, about glorifying God. Okay? He was selected. 
since you have given him authority over all flesh in order that he may give eternal life to all whom you have given to him. For this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. See? Jesus had not yet received his Godship back until after the resurrection. So that's why at that time, the Father was the only true God. Jesus could not be 100% man, 100% God. That's an impossibility. Okay. Verse 4, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me with your own self, with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Quite a prayer. Absolutely marvelous. And that comes all the way down to us because Jesus prayed for us as well. And those are the things we need to keep in mind as we're coming to the Passover, as we're preparing, as we're thinking about the foot washing, as we're thinking about the bread and the wine. And we need to do it exactly as Jesus has said, exactly in the timing that we find in the New Testament. Now let's come back here to John, the 12th chapter again, and let's, let's go forward with it, okay? John 12, and let's pick it up here in verse 29. Then the people standing there who heard it said, It thundered. Others said, An angel spoke to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice did not come because of me, but because of you. So you would know that God the Father selected him as the Passover lamb to take away the sin of the world. Now notice what else he said, and what this has done, because everything was complete up to this point. Now the judgment of this world is come, the ju is the judgment of this world. Now the prince of this world be, shall be cast out. Quite a thing. This had to be done in order to get rid of Satan, the devil. Now then, after the resurrection, his time of judgment has already been given. But, there has to be the preaching of the gospel, there has to be the building of the church, there has to be the character and, and conversion of all of those that God would call, so that with all the rest of the, of the saints, then the whole of the kingdom of God can be given to all of the sons and daughters of God at the same time. So we still live in a world where Satan is active. We're still subject to overcoming those things, okay? Then he said, And if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all to myself, but he said this to signify by what death he was about to die. Quite a powerful thing, isn't it? He let them know he was going to die. Now this confounded the Jews because the Jews were expecting the Messiah, and if he's the Messiah, well, surely he would come to us, and surely he he would recognize that we're the ones that are in authority. And after all, we have that authority from God. True, but they misused the authority, and they corrupted it by the schemes of Satan the devil, rather than God. So that's why he said this. Now notice what the people said. And the people answered him, we have heard out of the law that Christ lives forever. Why do you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So their spiritual blindness was quite a thing, wasn't it? Yes. Then Jesus said to them, Yet a little while the light is with you. 
Walk while you have the light, so that the darkness will not overtake you. For the one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. Now that's a true statement, prophetic from that time down to this. You can tie that going back to John, the third chapter, that those who believe are coming to the light. And those who do not believe do not come to the light because they don't want their evil deeds exposed for what they are. So this is quite a prophecy here, okay? So he says, verse 36, While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become the children of light. Very clear, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ as the light of the world, the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father, and if you do not believe that he is the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world, you have no life in you. You have no forgiveness in you. That's the whole purpose of his life, his death, his crucifixion, his resurrection, and the calling of the church. All centered around this. Okay, let's go ahead and take a break and we'll come back.